Hi, and welcome. And real quick, the Podcast Engineering School, the online training program, is starting on April 4th. Go to the website for all the details, podcastengineeringschool.com. That's right. It's going to be online training. Barry, you like online training, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I thought so. So check out the website for more information, podcastengineeringschool.com. Okay. We're ready to go. No feedback. You know, someone must have made a shirt that with like, you know, the Ghostbuster symbol with a ghost and there's the red circle with the line, red line mm-hmm. through them. Like it means no ghost. I'm sure someone made a, a shirt for audio engineers that says that has feedback and then a, a line through it. <laughs> that is definitely like, like tech nerdy. For sure. <laughs> that's terrible. Well, that's right. You stumbled onto it. This is session number 42 of the podcast engineering show. That's right. Here we go. Let's do it. Oh. Yeah. I hope my grunting and yes don't sound too lame. Welcome everyone to the show. I'm happy you're here. My name is Chris Curran. I'm a podcast producer. I've worked with Forbes and Dun & Bradstreet, produced podcasts for a lot of business authors as well and companies. And this show, every week, we bring you podcast production techniques on a silver platter. We get down and dirty. We talk shop about the audio engineering side of podcasting. This isn't about getting listeners and marketing and any of that stuff. This is about the audio engineering side so you can improve the quality of your sound and quicken your production time. Is that, is that a good way to say it? Quicken and, and speed up. I guess quicken works. It sounds very highlander is. You know? <laughs> oh, the quickening. Yes. That's right. So I interview podcast producers, engineers, and other specialists and experts on this show. And I have to make an announcement, uh, which you... This is so weird recording episodes in advance. Like, because I'm going to record a little... You, at the beginning of this, you heard a little recording, which was announcing the podcast engineering school that's going to happen in April. So... I guess I don't have to announce it now, right, Adrian? <laughs> well, that's the beauty of pre-recording and editing it in later. So I guess I should in my own head just realize that and I don't have to say anything. But the <laughs> Podcast Engineering School, this program is going to be... I, I can't even describe what this is going to be. Anyway, go to the website. Well, I Pod- haven't heard the uh, the actual bit, but I'm super excited for it. <laughs> PodcastEngineeringSchool.com. I actually have a background in audio engineering in the music business. And when I entered podcasting about four and a half, five years ago, I realized that a lot of podcasters, even podcast producers, are lacking in audio engineering skills, the hardcore skills. So that's what this show is all about. Of course, Barry's with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He loves this show. He sits with me every session. I almost said episode. Wow. So a couple quick things before I introduce my guest for today. PodFest Multimedia Expo. That's right. Today is February 2nd. And yes, I figured that out in advance. February 2nd. (laughs) You have time. You can sign up for the PodFest Multimedia Expo. It's in Orlando, Florida, February 23rd to 25th. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be speaking. Me and a couple other guys had this big, huge presidential suite thing that we got. So we might have a little gathering at some point. (laughs) So come hang out with us. It's uh, podfest.us is the website, podfest.us. It's going to be awesome. And also, if you happen to be passing through Lexington, Kentucky, because it happens, you know, sometimes you just, you're passing through Lexington, Kentucky, and you just need a coffee or something. Well, if it's April 21st or 22nd, you should definitely pop into the podcasting course. Again, I'm going to be there teaching. It's the first course designed for podcasters in medical education. So if you know anyone who's in the medical education field, this is all about podcasting specifically for them or you, and you, and or you, you can come hang out with me again, and uh, that's going to be a great program. Thepodcastingcourse.com. Of course, all these links are going to be in the show notes. And um, you, you need like the Barry White voice for those too, like thepodcastingcourse.com. Right? Well, Barry, Barry the maintenance guy, he's still in New Jersey. And as I mentioned on my last trip to New Jersey, <laughs> I tried to find him. I went to my old building because he was the maintenance guy, and he, I couldn't find him. I don't know if he had the day off. Barry, you didn't you didn't skip work that day, did you? No way. You crazy? Yeah, I, I mean, I knew you wouldn't. Uh, I know that reminds me, Barry, and because uh, I know Adrian, uh, my my guest, Adrian Buskey, he wanted to know this too. Barry, what is someone gonna need? 
to really produce a top quality podcast. You're going to need a couple of horses or a couple of mules. <laughs> All right. See, you know, you come to this show, you get the goods. Barry <laughs> delivers. Anyway, my guest is Adrian Buskey. He is the host and co-producer of Nerd for a Living podcast. Nerd for a Living. We're, I, want, I want to know how you came up with that. You're also the co-founder and creative director at Armadian Media. And again, the links to your sites are going to be on the show notes, so people can just go there and click at podcastengineeringschool.com. And Nerd for a Living, so you must consider yourself a nerd. I'm very nerdy, yes. That's probably my defining self-designation. Really? You you don't sound like a nerd, though. I don't look like one either. I look like a former, slightly <laughs> over-the-hill college football player. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a weird thing. Like, I was one of those those classic nerdy kids who, you know, grew up kind of small and runty and then shot up over six foot and got broad shoulders and looks like I should be, like, a lineman or something. But, yeah, no, giant nerd. Cool. So we're going to talk about your podcast and the production of your podcast because you're the guy who produces it from beginning to end, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, like my wife handles all like the booking and stuff, but when it comes to the technical side of it, yeah, that's all me. Oh, husband and wife team. Yep. Does she ever do We've been called a power couple before, so maybe like one time, but I'll take it. I'll, I'll hold on to the power couple thing. All right. There you go. Power couple, power podcasting couple. Is she on the show or no? Today or in general? In general. Sometimes. She comes in and co-hosts occasionally. We found that it like it's for a number of reasons, it's it tends to be a little cleaner just to have a singular host, but um certain guests it you know kind of helps to have a little color commentary. Nice. All right. So you produce your show. So we start each session of this show with the speed round or the lightning round. So we want to know. Give us the overview. Give us the 60 second or maybe 120 seconds. Give us the one or two minute overview of your equipment, your setup and and the flow. Like when you're sitting down to record a podcast, what do you do and what equipment do you go through and how do you record it? And then how do you edit it and finalize it and upload it? Just give us the quick overview. Wow, to fit that into 120 seconds. Yes. Okay. So um, then we're so, going to pick uh, through it, of course. <laughs> um, so I'm a Mac guy. So I've got an iMac, uh, 27 inch, uh, 3.4 gigahertz uh, with uh, 32 gig of RAM. So I want a little bit of power you know, under the hood. And then so from there, I go out to, uh, I've got a Lesus Multi Mix 8 USB mixer, which is. It's not, say, I wouldn't say it's super fancy. I've been operating on it for about four years. It does the job, but it doesn't, even though it's a multi-mix and it allows eight different mics or instruments to be plugged in, it's not really a multi-track mixer. That's something I haven't upgraded to yet, but mm. it's probably going to be in the, the cards pretty soon because this thing's kind of aging. I split off to a, a, a Pile four-channel headphone amplifier, which is only really necessary when, uh, you know, I've got both my wife and I recording or somebody else in the studio with me, but I do like having the extra granular control over the volume. So um, it's a it's a handy thing. Also, kind of extends my mic reach um, in here in the, the home studio, right? And so my primary mic, the one that I'm talking on right now, is an MXL 990, um, which is a relatively inexpensive mic. Um, I've had it for oh gosh, probably eight or nine years, and uh, but it picks up room tum like crazy. So you have to be <laughs> kind of careful with the gain because it, it really does have a broad reach. Mm. Um, but I really like the overall tone that it captures from my voice and gives me kind of a, a nice, like deeper, warmer, lower tone. Um, so I've just, and it's always just been an extremely dependable mic over all these years. So that's my go-to. We get a secondary mic that is usually the one my wife is on when she joins the show, which is a Sterling S50. It's another condenser mic. It's okay. It's not great. Um, it's got a little bit more of a high end. And so I, I don't love it as much and I don't like it on my own voice. Currently testing out an MXL 2006, which is, it's supposed to be kind of a little bit more of an upgrade over the 990, um, but I found it to be a little more trebly than I care for, so I'm still testing it out. Okay. Um, and when I record narrations, so our show is an interview show, but um, I record uh, intro and outro bumpers and uh, and then like sponsorship messages. And when I do that, I actually have a narration station that I have set up. Or that's what I call it, my narration station. Wow. Yeah. And so that actually, um, I do all that with, it's a, uh, an Audio-Technica AT-875R, um, which is, it's a condenser mic, but it's a directional that's, you know, you'd probably see it more commonly thinking of it as like a boom mic. You'd see it like in, in uh, video recording. Okay. 
but um, it gives a really great, deep, rich sound, and uh, and it tends to narrow out a lot of like room tone and house noises and stuff. So, nice. and I use that with a uh, an acoustic isolation shield. So, you know, I, I I have a lot of pop guards and you know and other kind of filters and stuff on my usual setup, but you know I use that isolation shield just for the narrations. And then uh, from there, you know, I I. I I do our interviews right now through Skype, which isn't a perfect solution, but it works well and most everybody has it. So, um, you know, it works well. But then I do all of my editing and all my workflow um, and my narration recording in Adobe Audition. Yes, Audition. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and the thing is, so when I first, the first podcast that I ever worked on uh, was for for another site and another show that was called Rocketbot Radio. And initially I did what I think a lot of people at least Mac users do, which is I tried using GarageBand and I was not satisfied with that experience. And then I moved to SoundBooth, which was what was available with the uh, the Adobe suite that I had at the time. And uh, I'm like a, a web designer, graphic designer, UX developer by trade. So I have like the whole Adobe suite. And uh, when they went to Creative Cloud, they put Audition on it, which was very similar to, to SoundBooth, but, um, but cranked up a couple notches. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what I've been using ever since. Cool. And then for your Skype interviews, how do you record the Skype interviews? I use a plugin called Ecamm Call Recorder, which used to be really rudimentary. And it's actually in the last, I would say like six to eight months, really kind of grown to be a far more useful tool with a lot of interesting things built into it. And uh, yeah, I found it to be pretty effective and it's very inexpensive for what it is. Cool. So you got every, then you bring everything into Audition and you bring all your pieces and everything. And then uh, how do you mix it down? Okay, so I have a pretty laborious editing process, and I'm a jack-of-all-trades guy, and I come from kind of a weird background of stuff, but my editing background from, like, college and some of the stuff that I did before my, I guess what you would call my real professional work was in TV editing, and so, like, I've got a real stickler editing mind, and when I get into editing interviews and narrations, Things like the ums and errs and all the and pauses and <laughs> dead spaces make me crazy. <laughs> so I really, I don't want to say I over edit, but like I do a heavy amount of cleanup on anything that we do. <laughs> you go um, nuts, basically. Yes, I go. I've been pulling back a lot actually <laughs> recently, just just for time's sake, because the amount of time that I would put into an individual episode was right a little outlandish. Yeah. Um, and actually, and by the time this show goes live, and you said it's like February 2nd, we will have released um, some new programming. We're doing, we're branching out the Nerd for a Living brand to, um, to some more niche channels. And and because I'm going to be producing multiple shows, it's definitely going to be a, uh, a period where I have to streamline my production in order to kick, kick things out the door a lot faster. Mm. But I can I can walk you through the existing process and you will probably melt down because of the sheer volume of stuff that's that's involved. Yes. Well, we are going to go through that. I want to hear every dirty detail. So but after you so you mix it down, you, you do all your editing within Audition, right? Right. Yeah, okay. I do. Um, and I do uh, what I call a modular editing style. So I put the, the different pieces together separately and then assemble everything in one master edit. So I edit the interview first, clean that up, get that down to, you know, a nice, you know, tight, clean version of the interview, do an export on that, do my narration and my sponsorship recordings, tighten those up, export those into Wave, and then I pull those into a master document where I place them all together along with my music beds, and then I do the final exports out of that. That's cool. All right. So when you mix it down to, you you make an MP3 right out of, right in Audition, right? Right, okay. correct. And what kind of MP3? I think it's mono because when I was listening to your show, I believe it's mono, right? Yes, yeah. So we export to mono mostly because, uh, well, a couple of reasons. I mean, one, you know, the, there are music beds on there, but it's not, you know, it's not a focus of our show for the music. So, um, you know, it's not a big deal. We want to keep the, the sizes down fairly low. Yeah. And also because we do, like, our, our stuff gets picked up by TuneIn and Stitcher. And, uh, and they, they'll do a lot of compression on your show unless you already export to a fairly small file size for their streaming. Mm. And their compression is nasty. Like, yes, yeah, It'll make your show sound terrible. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, after a little while of first, you know, going to their systems and going out and listening to it and being like, oh, th- I do all this effort to make the show sound good. <laughs> 
and then you make it sound like crap. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wasn't real keen on that. So yeah. I had to be conscious of, you know, of, of how we processed it out and trying to get it at the, at the right level where they would submit it through their systems without doing any more compression to it. Got but it. yeah, so um, so I export to a mono MP3 um, at 96K quality uh, constant bit rate, which my research of stuff over time seems to be relatively industry standard as much as you can tell what everybody does, you know? Yeah, yeah, 96 mono, 96K mono is actually a little above average. I think 64 mono is technically sort of like the standard because 64 mono equals 128 stereo, and that's like... 128 stereo is like that's the average mp3 so yeah i did i did 64 for years actually probably the bulk of our backlog is in 64 i upped it to 96 in the last i would say probably five or six episodes based on some stuff i was reading on libsyn talking about overall output quality and and uh you know the evolution of streaming and and internet speeds and lte and stuff like that yeah um and because you know there is a you know, a, a music element to the show as far as like, you know, the music beds and stuff just to kind of make it sound clean. I don't know that it's really made a tremendous difference audio sound wise though. So it's kind of a thing I'm experimenting with. I might jump, drop back down. Um, the next version of our show will probably include a little bit less of those music beds. So it may, probably the point will be moot. Okay. Yeah. Nine, 96 will sound better than 64, uh, but you know, you'd have to really listen back and forth and hear the difference. It's, it's subtle. It's a subtle difference. All right. Now, what do you do for loudness before you make the MP3? Do you make your, the mix a certain loudness? Um, yeah, I mean, I use, uh, I do a lot of, of adjustments to all of those, that audio and processing. And I mean, that's the thing we can talk through if, you know, if you're interested in all those kind of settings, but you know, I use hard limiters to, to bring things up to kind of an even level. And honestly, that's, that's something that's fairly recent in my mix. I mean, I'm kind of always evolving, you know, the nature of my system and right. like my, you know, I try not to, to rest on my laurels too much. I'm try, trying to always add a little, something new that, you know, when I find run into a problem of like, oh, you know, this, this particular interview ended up being too quiet or having this, you know, an issue hearing the person on the other end and going out and learning something new. So like I said, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades guy. And so I'm, I, I don't necessarily have a comprehensive amount of knowledge about everything that I jump into. I just learn on the fly and can keep adding it to my overall toolkit as I go along. Yeah, no, that's great. That's how, uh, that's how everyone is pretty much. So, uh, so yeah, the loudness, um, now there's these LUFS standards. It's like the final mix should be a certain loudness level for podcasts and there's different ones for like TV and radio and it's all this. So you can actually, once your mix is all done and before you make it an MP3, you can just adjust the loudness level. You can either use a plugin or I think even audition has something. I think, I don't know. I, they I, do. Yeah, yeah. They, um, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. It's, it's an, it's a kind of an interesting little moder monitoring tool you know, to show you what those loudness levels are and how the whole mix comes out. I tried using that um, after reading extensively about it. And no matter what I did with it, I only made my mix worse. Oh, wow. Um, which, I mean, obviously shows I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the overall loudness, right, is just bringing the whole thing up a slight bit or bringing it down a tad. Usually it's bringing it up because usually we don't mix. Well, I shouldn't say that we don't always mix it to the final loudness level. Usually we mix it a little lower. And then if you have some sort of a, a loudness adjustment, you can bring it up to minus 16 LUFs if it's stereo, minus 19 if it's mono. And services like Auphonic do that. Like you can upload your final mix there and it'll give you back the file that's leveled. That's one way, but you can do it in Audition. So we'll talk more about that. So you do, all right, Mono 96. All right, so let's step back now. This was good. That See, it's it's funny. Speed rounds <laughs> sometimes take longer, but this is cool. So all right, your microphone. It's an MXL 990, and I pulled it up here, and I'm looking at pictures of it. It's a large diaphragm condenser, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a serious mic, and it sounds really good on you, but like you said, it's it picks up room noise and stuff. So you you had mentioned that, you know, some you can't crank the gain too high or else there, there's too much room noise. So the the actual best fix for that would be to make your like to put 
dampers in your room so your room doesn't have as much room noise. And I have those, yeah. Right. So then you can crank up the level to where it, it needs to be. Because the level you want to record at a level where your voice at the loudest point is just under peaking at zero. Right, yeah. Yeah. Right. So um the way like typically when I'm doing the interview recordings, and I'm actually pulled back a little bit on this one because it, on my end it sounds a little different from most of my you know, conversations on Skype, but I sit with the gain at about seven or eight, and then the actual volume control for the individual mic at around like eight most of the time. And yeah, I mean, like, you know, I have to be wary of my, you know, obviously the distance from the mic and, and access and in, I can, <laughs> I, I have a, a kind of a big voice. I, you know, I tried to, to modulate that whenever I'm on the mic, but I can get very loud and, and peak really easily if I get excited, right. <laughs> and I can be a very excitable guy. So, um, so that's something I'm always very conscious about while ever, you know, doing recording is making sure that I'm not blowing out the levels. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing you can do, you've probably done it is those two, like you have the mic pre and then you have the fader or actually on the MXL on the multi-mix, it's a knob, but it's the fader. Um, right. Those two knobs, you can pretty much know where they should be and then really don't touch them, right? Right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I hardly ever adjust those. Like I said, I only adjusted it on this one um, just to kind of be careful of the overall sound quality. But for the most part, they just kind of sit, yeah. Right? Yeah, that's cool. The, something I would I would mention about that MXL 990 is that uh, it's it's weird. It kind of has to warm up. Huh. Um, you know, I found, and I've, and I've read this same thing in reviews, uh, you know, over time as I was kind of troubleshooting when I first got it, is that it's a mic that, that seems to do better if you kick it on, power it up, and then, you know, walk away and give it 15 or 20 minutes to, um, to kind of, I don't know, reach its full sound and potential. I have no idea why that is. You know, it sounds like very tube amplifier style. Um, right. But, uh, but for whatever reason, it does seem to be definitely a quality point and like i said it can pick up everything in a house and you know and i'm i'm you know i'm a guy who lives with you know my wife an autistic adult that we take care of and a small dog and we live in a bi-level and my studio is in the basement and the house itself is plaster walls and and uh, has a fair amount of natural sound dampening into it and the room itself i mean i've got you know foam all over the walls in here but uh you know it's still it's it's going to pick up a fair amount of stuff so whenever i go to do recording you know the first thing i do is go through the house and turn everything off nice you know it's like the you know whether it's the heater or a fan in the bathroom yeah. or you know and yeah. certain things i can't control if the if the fridge runs the fridge runs there's not much i can do about that but um hey come you know, on I, you can unplug the fridge <laughs> <laughs> for, for 45 minutes <laughs> oh certainly yeah yeah and then i would forget about it and then <laughs> that's it bad uh, times yeah then your wife would absolutely kill you yes all right here's the other thing about having a very sensitive and high quality microphone is the closer you can get to it the better so for instance you use an external pop filter for your mic right yeah i actually have it kind of doubled up so i have a, a sterling audio like you know mesh pop filter you know on a flexible arm that comes right. off and, and the it's a the mic is it's in a shock mount on a uh, a boom arm that comes off my desk here i've got this relatively inexpensive mesh wire filter that fits right onto the mic itself mm -hmm. and then i've got a pop filter on the front of it so it gives a little extra protection from you know moisture and pops and everything but if i so right now i'm probably six inches away from the mic got so it. if i get really close up on it this is how i sound yeah, see that, oh, I mean, you can hear that difference. That actually makes a huge difference. I know it, sometimes it's hard, though, to, when, to, to stay that close to a microphone all the time. But, right. It, it's yeah. certainly, um, you know, in conversation, you know, I, I allow myself to, to, to be, you know, a little bit further back and, and not be super boom voice. But yeah, whenever I'm doing narrations, I try to be up as close as possible in order to, you know, get that very clean, deep, rich <laughs> sound. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you did that all the time, that would be better. I mean, it'd be awesome. So, I mean, it would just kill my back. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It, you know, if you can do it comfortably, that's fine. The other, so uh, right, so you can't lean over, you can't be in a weird position. That's you can't do that. And also, you can't be so like if you have an external pop filter that's like a big hoop. Sometimes when you get close to that thing, like sometimes you need to look at a computer screen or read off of a piece of paper. And if your face is like 
you know, a half an inch from the pop filter. Sometimes it like gets in the way of your eyes and you can't really see what you need to see. So <laughs> there are good reasons for not being that close. So yeah, I mean, you have to do what feels comfortable, do what works. I mean, certainly I can hear the room sound in your mic, but it's not, it's not really bad. There's also a thing that, that I've found over time is that I tend to speak a little above or a little below the mic, particularly on my narration mic, which is very directional, because if there's something that makes me crazy, it's mouth noises. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, my God, listen to NPR <laughs> and hear all those people with dry mouth noise. Yeah, yeah. I hate that. Yep. And what, what I found is that when you when you're just slightly off axis, so the mic is not pointed like directly into your mouth, you don't get nearly as much of that just kind of wet mouth noise. You get much more of, of what you're putting out rather than what's kind of happening internally. Right. OK, so now when your wife does come on the show with you and she uses a Sterling S50, you said, right? Correct. That's yeah. also a condenser? Yes. Also, yeah, the condenser. It's a pretty inexpensive mic, and like I said, it's it's got a much more high end, which works pretty well for her voice because it's you know she's got a you know a higher voice than me for sure. Um, so you set up in the same room. Yep. Yep. Just in the same room. And you face each other. Um, kind of. Uh, we we're not like a, across the table really. It's like uh, you know we sit at like kind of one big desk and you know the the 27 inch monitors kind of huge and uh, and so the, you know we have the mics on booms that come out to, to both of us mm. one of the benefits for us of using Skype is that whenever possible we try to do video along with our you know audio chat okay and the reason for that we don't record it we only record the audio stream but we try to do video whenever possible because it really helps with people keeping from speaking over each other. Yeah. It makes it a lot simpler, especially if you get a host or, or myself, for that matter, um, that can ramble on um, <laughs> the visual cues to kind of stop somebody and halt them and be like, OK, we need to get on track or move on to the next thing is a lot easier when they can see that visual. And without it, I feel like it's a it's it becomes a much bigger problem about like kind of getting off track. Yeah, that is really helpful. And, and really, there's no I mean, you can do it on Skype, but the Skype, the audio on Skype is just not great. I mean, there are times when someone can connect, they have a good setup and, and just miraculously there's a great connection and it sounds fine. But mostly it's, it's compressed. It's limited. The bandwidth is cut down. Minima, you know, it's, they chop off a lot of the bandwidth, especially the high end. And it, it's just not great. But I mean, you could see each other. So I was a few years ago, there was this company who had uh, like the the cast interface that you and I are connected on right now, which is what I use to instead of Skype. This inter ma imagine this cast interface, which actually does local recordings of every guest. So it it does like you know it's right now right now on your computer, Adrian. It's recording your mic audio onto your computer, and then every thirty five or forty five seconds, it uploads it in the background. So. In the end, I'm going to get a local recording of you. So if the internet ever glitches, I don't even care. So there was a platform like this that also had video. So you could see your guest. Like you said, it just everything you said, it does that. And it does the local recordings of all the guests. It was tremendous. And then they got bought by... Oh, I forget the name. What was the name of that? Blab. Blab bought them. Oh, Blab FM. Blab, Blab FM bought them. This is a couple of years ago. And then, of or course, Blab now Blab's IN. out of business. Yeah, yeah. And they just they just tanked their whole system. Yeah. I mean, can we get a system? I mean, why, it seems like a simple solution. I don't know. I don't know. I You know, this is the thing. I deal with so much audio over the internet. I have these ideas of, like, things that I want, like inventions that would solve so many problems. And if I had, you know, $10 million, I'd be hiring teams to, to invent this stuff. But I don't have $10 million. <laughs> You have $10 million for me, Adrian? Not laying around, unfortunately, no. See, some people do, you know? So I, I know. think if you're a billionaire, that means you have a hundred, you could have a hundred different accounts with $10 million in each account. That equals a billion. Then you could just give me one. You know, you just go find Kevin Hart or Pharrell, <laughs> or one of those guys that are really interested in, in investing in tech and like expanding their overall reach and just, you know, give them a really good pitch. You never I mean, know, it could happen. Oh, I, anyway. All right. So you have the two mics. So you're not really facing each other. So then each mic 
there's some bleed in the mics. Like your voice ends up in your wife's microphone and her voice ends up in your mic, right? A little bit? Yeah, a little bit. It's, um, you know, we, we turn out a little bit, but, you know, I got to say, like, it, the, the, the stuff that we find overall is that, you know, I mean, I, I try as much as possible to get a really nice, you know, quality overall recording. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I, I, I try to keep myself from sweating, like, the getting, you know, perfect kind of audio. The thing is, so, you know, to backtrack just a minute, like, I worked in radio for 11 years. Now, I was a digital guy. I worked on, like, the website of things. But I was in the studio every day photographing bands and doing video interviews and occasionally doing, you know, like, being the secondary guy uh, on some of the shows. And, uh, and after working in radio for forever, you know, I kind of noticed that like that they didn't, you know, for all of you would think that they would be really, really stressed about, about audio quality kind of wasn't the studios that we had. Um, and th- this was the, the primary station I worked at for a long time is like the most, like one of the most prominent alternative rock stations in the country and a huge powerhouse here in St. Louis. And, you know, they didn't even have pop guards on their mics. And I mean, they had nice mics. Well, but they, they what was it RE twenties, right? Probably. Probably. Yeah. 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 So those you can technically use those without a pop filter. That's what I'm talking to. But I do I do slip a little pop filter over the top. But but yeah, those yeah. are also dynamic mics. But go ahead, keep going. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely a difference in it. But um, you know, I guess if you know if you listen to terrestrial radio and listen to people in studio, like it, to station to station, you know, sometimes it's very very clean. Sometimes it's it's not. I mean, some of that is actually you know, I've noticed that you know if you go market to market, certain certain markets have a much cleaner overall sound. Like if you go to Chicago, I feel like everything up there sounds really produced, mm. particularly top 40 stations, but everything. You go into the St. Louis market and there's a looser, raw kind of feel because I think that uh, here locally, KC95 really it, like kind of set the tone for the market. And so that tends to be kind of how everything sounds. But in general, you know, the the found that like the the quality of the recording is a huge boost for the 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 audience listening to it. But the content is the king and um the most podcast listeners i've found and that i've talked to will forgive a certain amount of of issue or mostly not even notice it as long as the interview and the guest and or the content of the show is really really strong i mean obviously we want to get it to sound as good and professional and uh you know and mostly just keep it out of the way you know and i feel like the production should be something that the the listener doesn't notice the fact that people do occasionally, you know, say to me, oh, gosh, you know, I, you know, your show sounds as good as like a, like a Tim Ferriss podcast or something like that, um, which is something, a comparison people have made a lot of times, which I think is interesting because, you know, we're pretty dissimilar. Hmm. Um, although I, I like Tim and I, you know, I've read his stuff, but, uh, you know, like that overall, they'll be like, oh, the production or the sound of it reminds me of that kind of show. And if you go and listen to Tim, he, you know, he will talk about the fact that he doesn't make you know, he doesn't go out of his way to create like a, a super elaborate setup either. You know, he mostly tries to get something that sounds as good as he can without it being something in the way, you know, and still delivers a really good sounding overall product. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're certainly there with your mics and everything. And, and for, for the any room noise that comes through your mics, even if there's two condensers in the room, it's still not, you know, not a showstopper for sure. Well, and I also filter out a lot of that in post. So... You know, I try to, get, you know, to limit as much of it as possible before, you know, obviously you'd rather not to do, you know, it's better to get it right in the mic than do it in post. But, but I do do a lot of work. So if we, you know, if we get it deeper into the process, I'll, I'll walk through that. But, um, you know, yeah. I certainly make efforts to get rid of the extra junk in there too. Good, good. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. All right. Let's talk about your narration station. I love it. So you have a different mic, you have an acoustic isolation shield, and you use this for your voiceovers. Just describe that real quick. Sure. So, um, so it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's an Audio-Technica AT875R. I decided on that mic after doing a tremendous amount of, of research into what I wanted to get. I really had expected to get like, you know, there's the super fancy Sure. I don't know if it's like, I want to say it's like the 5150, but that's probably wrong. But a, a lot of podcasters use it and, you know, and a couple of other like really high end or at least I guess really high end is in the many thousands of dollars we're talking in the, you know, five, 600 range or something for, for one of those. And I watched uh, a couple of different people do basically mic shootouts where they tested, you know, a number of different mics to find the overall sound. 
And also I had, I had done some interviews with some other like podcasters and seen or had conversations with them about their stuff. And I would see that, you know, they were using these high end mics, but I would listen to their shows and they'd have really, really flat sound for themselves. And it'd be, it'd be clean, you know, it'd be like, you know, it'd be absent of room noise and it would be, you know, a very clean sound, but it was super flat. Right. Um, you know, and I'm always kind of chasing that, um, I don't know that I guess like Roman Mars kind of sound. Mm. You know, if you listen to like 99% Invisible, Roman Mars has that great, deep, rich, warm tone. Like the, as soon as he starts talking, you have that like, uh, you know, it's, you feel very engaged because he's that kind of speaker. And part of that is just his overall delivery is fantastic. But he also has that tone. Or like on the female side, Phoebe Judge, who does Criminal, has has a really like she's got a, you know, kind of a, a deeper but still soft female voice. Um, and the production on that is very clean and warm as well. And so for me, when I think about the quality of the mic sound and, you know, and how people sound on it, a big part for me is that I don't want flat. I want a dynamic sound and I want it to have that warmth and uh, and to catch the quality in a person's voice that you don't necessarily hear just sitting next to them. You know, when you plug somebody, you, when you, you know, somebody plugs in their earbuds and they get really, you know, intimate with your voice. I want that mic to capture all of the dynamics and all of the, the extra quality of the voice that you wouldn't necessarily hear otherwise. Right. So, yeah. So, um, so I, I, after doing that, that research and that, you know, checking out that shootout and trying stuff out, the recommendation that this one particular site had come up with was that Audio Technica. And I was, you know, it was, I thought it was pretty interesting that they were using essentially, a directional condenser boom mic as this, you know, primary mic, but everything that they did in their test, it was the one that kept coming out the best. And right. it wasn't terribly expensive. I want to say maybe 200 bucks or something on Amazon or B&H, wherever I got it at. And so, yeah, I mean, setting it up in, in the room, like it, um, like I got it and I got a monoprice acoustic isolation shield, which again was, I want to say like, a little over a hundred bucks and it looks much sharper than that. You know, it's the beauty of some of the cheap stuff on Amazon. <laughs> right. And, and that isolation shield, that's the kind of thing that like literally it's a bunch of foam that surrounds the mic and you sort of put your face, like you, you put the mic in there and you speak into it. And so that your voice gets totally dampened. It doesn't go all around the room and then reflect back into the mic. Right. Right. Yeah. And I actually, I mounted it. It's, um, it's designed to be uh, like a desktop mount, um, although you can hang it from the ceiling or a lot of different stuff. I mounted it to a, I guess it's a speaker stand. I'm a musician, so I have a whole bunch of extra gear laying around all nice. the time. And so I mounted onto that. So it actually, like, it's, it's, I designed it for standing. So when I read my narration versus like right now where I'm sitting and, you know, you know, long from interview, you like to be able to sit. But when I do the actual narration bits, I do that standing. So I have like full control of my diaphragm and, and airflow. And it also that allows me to like to be a little bit more physically dynamic while I'm talking. I'm a, I talk with my hands a lot. And if I do that right now, I'll be making all kinds of noise with like, you know, my chair and stuff like that. Yeah. So being able to stand up and kind of deliver things more and try to, cause I can find that if I, if I make myself sit really still and try to do those narrations, I can give a really dry read and coming from the world of radio and being in the studio with, with, with people, most of the time, the jocks, whenever it came time to light up the mic and do, you know, a stop set or to do, you know, just a two minute bit in between songs, they almost always were standing. So that's just a thing I kind of picked up from that. And so, yeah, so, um, so I do the narration standing at the, at the isolation shield. And what do you record on then? Um, I record, um, to audition directly. Nice. All right. Yeah. So that, the mic, the AT875R, I just looked it up. Yeah. It's a little short shotgun and it has a real a pretty tight, polar pattern as well so it rejects yeah. a lot of the sound um it reminded me of yesterday when on b and h the b and h website they had a deal for the i don't know if you've ever heard of the sennheiser mkh 416 so the mkh 416 is a short shotgun tube microphone by sennheiser mm -hmm. it's normally a thousand bucks and this is like voiceovers use this mic like this is like renowned a renowned voiceover mic mm -hmm. so it's normally a thousand bucks it was on sale for 599 so here i was on the web going you know oh man that's a good deal i don't know <laughs> could i use it wow i don't know when could i use it <laughs> i'm trying to convince myself but luckily i just bought a lot of plugins which um yeah which i think i talked about last week if i'm 
if I'm speaking properly. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's cool. All right. So now you got things in audition. Now, uh, what I like what you said about when you have things in audition is that you, for instance, the interview itself, you have in audition and you do all the edits on the interview and you sort of finalize that. Then you finalize the other pieces too. And then you create this master session where you've put it all together. So let's start with the interview. Let's start okay. with you, how you treat the audio, like how you process it, EQ, compression. And then, and then after that, we could talk about editing. But let's just stick to when you're tightening up the interviews. How do you process that audio? So initially, um, so like I said, I, I use the Ecamm recorder plugin and the the output from that, it's weird on my end. And I know it's not just me because I've encountered other major shows that have had this problem, but it like the initial recording that it'll make will sound kind of doubled. And, uh, and what's happening is that it's recording the guest on one track on, you know, one channel, and then the other channel is recording both of us. So it'll leave my voice sounding normal because I'm only on one, but it'll double the guest. Um, but the Ecamm rec um, recorder plugin comes with an additional tool that's called movie tools because it initially records it as an MOV file because it, um, you know, you can record both uh, the video and audio. And we, like I said earlier, we want to record the audio. Right. But so before I'm even out of Skype, I have that extra tool that pops up and I split the track into those, you know, those two different channels um, and export them as separate wave files. And then I have the one wave file that has both. Right. Like I said, it's not ideal because I, you know, have us both on one channel, but um, um, which causes, you know, a little bit of problems sometimes in leveling, but it's it's not overwhelming. Here's Well, here's the thing, though, too, is I know there's a way to fix that. There's got to be, because I know many people who use Ecamm, and typically it's one person on the left, one person on the right, uh, you know, the other person on the right. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a setting somewhere. I, I don't use that, so I, I don't really know. So certainly by the time this episode comes out, someone who's listening is going to post a note on Facebook or something with the solution, but um, that would be fantastic. I, you know, and even as we were setting up here before getting this recording, you know, we ran into a little problem with something coming through my board. That was a matter of literally unclicking a button, you know, and yeah. those buttons are all clicked because they worked in other systems, you know, setups, but this time it caused, you know, a feedback loop on your end and it was an easy fix once we figured it out. So it's entirely possible that same thing might be causing that problem in Skype and it might just be an issue with my board. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, no, it's probably the Ecamm software. Possible. I've yeah, I've tried everything. Oh, you I could, have. Okay. You know, you know, switch off and on in that, and never found an issue. But then again, you know, sometimes the workarounds are just you know incredibly simple, but are just in a place you've never looked. Exactly so, yeah. right. So, by the, so just to real quick tell what happened right before we started recording is that we connected through Cast, and then I was hearing myself feeding back to myself, and then you couldn't hear it. You just heard me, and that was okay. So I we were trying to figure out where that feedback loop was coming from, and it was kind of you know, you have a mixer that's a USB mixer and I've actually never owned a USB mixer. And so I don't know all the routing. So I was a little unsure. I really didn't know what to tell you to change. So that, like you said, we just started clicking buttons. And I think the button you ended up clicking was one that sends the USB to the main mix or something like that. Right. So yeah. you, you sort of undid, unpressed that button and it just went away, which was, which is kind of cool. The, uh, the interesting effect on that is that so, you know, while we're talking, I'm also recording this through QuickTime just to you know, create a backup. And that QuickTime recording is only recording me and not you. Nice. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting that I think because of disconnecting that particular, you know, the clicking off that one button now is only tracking me on the computer itself, even though I can hear you just fine. Wait, you know what? Maybe that maybe this will solve that problem with Ecamm, too. Maybe that's my hope. You know, like I said, it's, you know, it's funny like, over time you, you find things that work and you <laughs> run with them. And then, you know, sometimes you end up having a problem that you can't immediately solve. And then you just find workarounds for it. And, you know, sometimes it's two years later and you're like, oh, I just could have clicked a button. I don't totally. Know. I mean, that happens to me every week. It seems like it's like I find a little either it's a keyboard shortcut or it's something where it's like, oh, my God, if I had this a year and a half ago. <laughs> Well, you know, and that's funny, like, so something like the next step in my process, once I take that WAV file and bring it into audition, right. my next step now is something I've only been doing for like maybe five episodes because I didn't know it existed before. Hmm. And that was the capture noise print and uh, a noise reduction process. Nice. I straight up did not know that was there. And while I was trying to solve a different problem 
with an issue I happened to stumble across somebody talking about it and uh, and then start, you know tried that out in the initial raw wave file and it was like oh my god why why have I done 70 episodes yeah. and never seen this before <laughs> so just to explain what that is real quick if it's it's uh it's like a plugin in audition right and it it'll sort of scan the file at certain places and make a noise print of the noise so it kind of the, the program determines what what is the nature of the noise in the background and it looks at it really deeply and really finely and and it makes a noise print it can actually save it as a noise print meaning that's this is the nature of the noise in the background. And then you can remove the noise because it knows exactly what it is it, it, and it can tell the noise from the voice. So it's very handy. I use that. I used to use that in SoundForge. Um, I still do sometimes. So it's, great it's definitely great for removing uh, room tone and, you know, certain levels of background noise. And it's, you know, you need about five to 15 seconds um, of, of, you know, dead air at the beginning of a recording mm-hmm. in order to cleanly grab it. The one issue that I have had with it is that it's occasionally kind of, I feel like over aggressively dead in some of that sound. And there occasionally will do some, some weird bit of enveloping or filtering on things like just the sound of people's breath. You know, if they're just in the background yeah. um, and it'll make it very tinny or robotic sounding. And so there's occasionally I'll have to go through and, um, undo the, the the noise reduction process and then kind of capture a smaller bit of of uh, noise print or just tweak the settings a little bit in order to you know eliminate some of those issues it doesn't tend to be a big problem but it's something i run into now and then yeah i think what you can do is once you take the noise print that should be good but then when you actually apply the noise reduction to the audio there should be like a a fader like how much reduction do you want you want to reduce it 10 db you want to reduce it 20 db yep or 30 db so if it's removing too much you can actually just you know move that you just remove a little less that's what i I do all the time because actually not only does it affect breaths it'll affect voices like the sibilance of and the clarity of a voice it'll take away if you if you use too much noise reduction like that a voice will become a little more dull and a little more computer sounding. So you got to watch that. Yeah, it's definitely something that, you know, it's super handy, but like any one of these tools that, you know, if you use, you might feel like, oh, I used it once and I set a setting and I just apply it every time. And like, now it really has to be tweaked every time. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you got the noise reduction, then what? So then I do, um, I do a full edit of the episode, you know, so just going into the, uh, I, you know, in, on, on, into audition um, in the main you know, multi-mix file. And, uh, and then I just, <laughs> like I said earlier on, like I cut out the ums and errs and, and, uh, weird digressions, um, sometimes clean up, um, just a, you know, train of thought sometimes, you know, sure. people get talking and, and it's easy to kind of digress or lose yourself with it. And a comment that we get a lot from our guests after the fact, especially ones that have been on a lot of podcasts is they'll, the, they, they almost like universally say, oh my gosh, you made me sound so smart <laughs> because you chopped out all of my digressions yeah. and, you know, stop words and ums and errs. And, and, uh, and so what you get is a cleaner overall conversation yeah that happens all the time on i co-host a show and some guests they'll sort of really stumble at certain questions and then it's like they'll stumble multiple times and then we'll be done and they'll be like oh my god i'm so sorry i think i was a terrible guest and we're like no literally we'll tighten it up you'll it'll it'll be fine <laughs> and it really works that way the other thing what you know one funny thing i just thought of sometimes people will be talking and 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 they'll say the word and like eight times mm-hmm. you can you could take out six of those eight it, it's nice yep. it tightens it up <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, the, I think the the um, the thing you have to watch out for is making sure that you don't remove the natural flow of the conversation, because you know some of those things are still like the sometimes a long pause or an um or something does affect the you know the meaning of the thing that they say afterwards, yeah. um, or it affects the flow of the conversation. Totally. So you do have to be conscious of those things. But yeah, at the same time, I you know I, nothing kills a podcast for me quicker than listening to a show that's had no editing at all and not tightened up and has big <laughs> long drawn out pauses or you know let's let's their guest mumble their way through something and uh you know like any of us like you know we only get so much time of the day and we're trying to you know maximize as much as possible okay. and if there's five minutes of unnecessary content in that podcast that's a that's a pretty good chance that i'm not going to come back to it yeah and the flow too all right so you tighten it all up then what 
I tighten it all up, and then I uh, and then I export a wave of that version of it. Got it. So the only processing I've done on it at that point is the noise reduction, and and then I've done the edit, but I haven't done anything else to it. So I, I export a raw interview, and then I re-import that raw interview, you know, forty four point one wave, and then I do a batch of processing in Audition. So um, there I do a hard limiter um, in order to bring up all those levels and also kill any of the peaking. I've got a multi-band compressor option that I set up, and usually that's to deepen some of the tones and, and soften any of the sharpness, um, uh, particularly if I'm talking to somebody who, like, whether their connection you know makes it more trebly or they have a higher voice, and I kind of tone that down a little bit. Right. If necessary, I use a dehummer. That used to be my go-to before I figured out the um, the noise print and noise reduction process. And I still will use the dehummer even without that because there's a certain quality of the of the vocal that I can get by adjusting, you know, pulling out just a little bit of of you know the overall sound. Um, it's not always necessary, but use it once in a while. There's an automatic click remover that I don't tend to see as being a big issue, but it will pluck out some little background things that, you know, happen from people, you know, tapping their desk or or making a little bit of noise. And every once in a great while, I'll put a de-esser on there. I don't, it doesn't seem to be something I run into a big problem with overall, but once in a while there'll be a speaker or even myself, you know, that is hitting those S's hard. And so the de-esser is kind of handy for that. Right. And then so, you know, I run that process and then do everything in my power to make sure that everything that comes out after that sounds organic and doesn't, you know, that it hasn't in any way, you know, messed up or muddied up the mix. I export that um, that interview wave, and so that part is done. Like I said, I do it modular, and there's a really, there's a lot of reasons for doing that. But then, well, wait, hold on. Is one of the reasons for doing that that you can save each step along the way? So if you have to step back one step, you can easily. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. That's that's, that, that's de- definitely part of it. the The two other parts for the modular system is that I actually found that it like it speeds up my export times you know, the render times and some of the stuff. So like when I'm, if I have the thing that's just the full edits and I'm doing all the processing on top of it, sometimes that render can take a long time. Whereas when I separate them out, it's super quick. Right. Um, Got it. And then the other reason is because when I put together my final master edit, every once in a great while, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally because we talk to guests who work in entertainment, they might drop something that they weren't supposed to say. Whether it's, uh, oh, I mentioned something that wasn't ready to be announced yet, or if, you know, they, we have one time where somebody, you know, like, we, we were talking to somebody who works for Marvel, and they had said something that wasn't, I wouldn't say, like, inflammatory, but it was, like, not incredibly positive about something to do with Marvel Studios, and uh, and it had to be filtered through, the, the whole interview had to be filtered through their PR department, and they came back, and they were like, okay, we really can't have this in here, and we don't think this is a very favorable part, so this needs to be cut out. Right. And that was our agreement with it, but the show had already gone live, and so I had to go back into the edits and chop that part out. Right. And at that particular point in time, I was not doing the modular system. And it was actually a bigger pain than I would have expected um, to go into my original edit to, you know, which I mean, if you would see my spectrographs and see, I mean, like, the, I mean, there's a bazillion edits in there. Mm. And uh, and so it was just, you know, it's a little bit of a, I mean, it wasn't a nightmare, but it was a hassle. Right. Um, now, going through this modular system, it's way easier for me to uh, to get in and pull a little piece of something out and tighten everything back up, you know, in a couple of minutes right. um, versus what it was like before. Nice. So then you assemble your master session. Yeah. So, well, I, well then I, um, you know, after the interview, then I record my intro, outro narration, like I said, directly through audition using my narration station. Um, I also record our sponsor messages at the same time, typically. And then um, I do, I edit the narration and do a very similar process to the last one, probably with a little bit less overall processing required because you know it's just me and not a skype feed or another voice and it you know at that point i'm you know pretty conscious of getting it just the way i want it through the mic but i'll still run you know a hard limiter and a dehummer on it if need be because there's still that you know running fridge in the background somewhere and then yeah and then i so i import both those things into a master edit template so you know one template that i've got set up that i use over and over again and so I piece together the narration over music beds, insert the sponsor messages, layer in the theme song, put in the interview edit, add the outro uh, and music beds at the end. I'll adjust the audio levels to kind of you know bring all the different tracks up. So yeah, I think it's about it's usually about six tracks total in the master track. Okay. And uh, you know, and then just do a final bit of master leveling to get the you know the the volume level to where i want it and every once in a while i will add a uh, fft filter 
onto like the interview or something if it just tonally doesn't feel like it matches where the narration's at. And uh, and so I can do a little bit of frequency tweaking in order to to bring that sound to like where I want it to be. That's pretty rare. I don't usually have to do that. What what's an FFT filter? Is that kind of like an EQ? Kind of, yeah. You know, I, I I wish I could get more technical than than <laughs> it is. It's just a um, it's a it's another little plug-in element in Audition that um, that I found through reading tutorials and and I, you know I I think I only really discovered it maybe like six months or so ago. But it really can you know with a little bit of tweaking can just have enough of a tonal change, you know, on a track that it can uh, you know I can like I said I can get it to match the narration a little bit closer. Okay, in terms of frequencies. Right. Like if like if your narration is brighter and and your interview is not as bright, you can brighten it up a little. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, like my my goal most of the time is warmth. And, you know, and I think that, you know, it's a very subjective, you know, kind of term to throw into those things. But I feel like, you know, I know it when I hear it. And so I'm always trying to get as close as I can to that kind of tone that when somebody plugs into their ears, that it's not only that they enjoy the show and they know it sounds good, but I want it to feel good. Totally. And that sounds like that kind of creepy. Like I want it to feel no, really no, no. good. It, there, yeah. Look, yeah. It's, sound is, is just that. It's a medium where we can craft it and control it to some to a, a large degree so yeah i mean you you want the sound you want and warm is a great way to describe it and uh yeah clear i'm sure it has to be clear though because you need you need low frequencies and high frequencies you need them all oh, yeah so yeah. uh but that's great no that's that shows that you know what you want and and you know how it feels and you know how to hear it so see that's that's the the reason why i, I like interviewing guys like you because you're not an audio engineer but you you know that you know what it sounds like and you can use the tools you have to adjust it and that's awesome that's all you got to do it's tr- i love it you know i think it's 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 a funny thing when you're when you're jumping into something when you're you know, it's not your expertise there's a weird learning plateau where i think you initially sound like crap and then you kind of figure out a few things and maybe you go find a mic that's like nicer. You know, I feel like everybody, like people have that first jump where they get they go get a Yeti or, or a Blue, yep. you know, or Snowball or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. And they'll make that nice little step up in sound. And for a little while, they'll sound great. And then they'll start having that like, oh, you know, I need to learn and, and do some stuff. And then as you get into the learning curve and you start trying to add those new things into it, you end up kind of dicking it up and, and, and kind of making a mess of the sound all <laughs> over again. And then you're rebuilding it from there. At least this is the way it works for me. Um, <laughs> and then, the, you know, and you're kind of rebuilding it and uh, and redesigning your sound from there because your own taste level and your ear and your understanding of the sound have evolved. And, you know, and so some of those things are going to be subtle. Your listeners aren't necessarily always going to be able to pick up on them, but you will know on your end that, you know, that it's improved and that you've picked it up. And I think that that's very, very satisfying. Totally. Um, I have a friend who uh, has occasionally like called me up after I've put a new show out and she'd be like, oh my God, this sounds so much better. Like that new narration sounds incredible. Like, what uh-huh. did you do? Cause she has a podcast too. And uh, you know, and I'll be like, oh, I, somebody noticed, you know, yeah, that's good to hear. Totally. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And you know what? And just remember if you're listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, the sound, it's so hard to do. Guess what? You know when it matters most is when someone's driving 85 miles an hour down a highway in Utah and, and, they, and <laughs> they, they need to be able to hear what you're saying. And oh, I'm not yeah, joking. You know, and that's, the, you know, it's a huge <laughs> difference to, you know, I, li- listening to your mix on your desktop computer or your laptop or whatever with, an, with a real nice pair of, you know, cans on versus popping in your earbuds and walking around with it versus listening to, uh, you know, a podcast like in the car or on the treadmill. Um, yeah. Or the, yeah, the treadmill, whatever, like, you know, like, especially like car speakers, like it's such a, it's such a completely different listening experience than it is listening through headphones or earbuds. There are some shows that I absolutely love that I cannot listen to in the car <laughs> um, because the mix just doesn't work. Yeah. Why, why can't you listen? Um, because the sound design just doesn't work. Okay. Um, there's a there's a show that I really enjoy called Flash Forward, and it's host. Uh, the host is named uh, Rose Evelith, and it's a really interesting, really cool show. Um, but Ro- Rose has kind of um, a a little bit of a higher, sharp, slightly pitchy voice, and um, she just recently got a new mic for the show, and you can tell the difference. It mm. helps a lot. But she speaks fast, and she has very tight clipped diction. 
And, you know, my, my earbuds, like, I feel like I have like a, a level of control over what it sounds like and it, and it works for me when I listen to it in the car, I find it intolerable. Interesting. Um, and, uh, and I can't quite put my finger on why that is. I just know that like that show doesn't work for me. There's another great show called imaginary worlds. And I can't think of the, uh, oh, Eric Malinsky is the host on that. Mm. And, uh, that's another one that, um, when I listen to it in the car, it's too sparse, like the production on it. It's very, very clean and very NPR-ish, but um, lacks a certain depth and, and is a little flat. And so in my earbuds, it sounds fine. But in the car, it's kind of like there's not enough there to listen to for 20 minutes. <laughs> right. So deep. So I'm really happy to speak with you about all this. I really enjoyed hearing about your setup. And I really like the fact that, you know, again, you're not an audio engineer, but you don't need to be. You're using your ears. You're doing it. And you're sounding really good. So well done, sir. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I would make a note of just saying that like at the end of the export, I, I export to MP3, but I also export to OGG with right. a VBR quality of 40%. And the reason I do that and I upload that to my Libsyn, you know, along with my MP3 is that uh, certain web browsers prefer an OGG format over MP3 for streaming. And so it's there. And, and I found that because um, the early version of the Nerd for a Living website had an audio player right on the homepage and it only worked with OGG and it was like built into the theme we were using on the site at the time. And so I, and I had to be like, OGG, what the heck is that? Um, I'd never even encountered it before. Mm. And, uh, and so, you know, it's just become part of the workflow to kind of kick that out at the same time. And then at the end of that, I edit the MP3 with an ID3 editor. Which, I mean, I think is one of those steps that a lot of people, they first jump on the podcasting, don't even realize that it's a thing they need to do. Yeah. But it's super important. Yep. The ID3 editor. Man, you got to add the add the little photo or the, or the you got to add the image file, which should be uh, the experts are, t- uh, I, I've heard, or I've learned to say 600 by 600 pixels right in the ID3 editor. Then, of course, you got the title and the author and then some notes and then you could put your copyright, all that good stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Adrian Buskey, Nerd for a Living. Yeah, you can uh, find us at nerdforaliving.com is the uh, the hub for everything that we do. Like I said, by the time the show goes live, we should um, have had some major announcements. A lot of that thing is still in development as we're recording this, so I can't really go into the details of it. But uh, you should see some significant evolution of the brand and, uh, and our products um, by the time the show goes live. That's awesome. Well, check it out. Nerd for a Living podcast. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, this has been awesome, Adrian. Thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And thank you for listening. Again, don't forget about the program that's coming up, Podcast Engineering School. And look, we really appreciate appreciate you listening. And if you have any questions, definitely email me or send me you know, a note on Twitter, anywhere. I'm here to help you. I'm here to answer your questions. You can always comment on the blog post as well. So thanks for listening. And until next time, sound great. Yeah.
Yeah.